Here we go. Thank you for coming out. Today we're going to do um, this thing up here, documenting the human experience. So to start out, a little bit about my um, professional background in photography, some of the work that I've, I've been doing as of late. I've had the good fortune to shoot for uh, Prudential Insurance. Shot a micro campaign for them earlier this year. Stuff like this. Can everyone see OK? Cool, cool. Some of those. Uh, some of the work that I shot was featured in Martha Stewart Living uh, online, which is pretty cool. Uh, I shot for this Arts and Leisure magazine in South Texas, SMTX. Um, I was sort of commissioned to come in and, as like a pseudo staff photographer for a little while, do these profiles on, on artists, artisans, chefs, sort of a maker series, anyone who uh, had something that they were being, you know, talked about for, lauded for. This is a small uh, brewery, a startup brewery that made really, really wonderful products. Uh, homebrew. Some more stuff here. This guy's in special effects. I got to spend an afternoon with him in his studio as he made sort of like the monster masks that you see in some of these movies. This guy's an ex-Olympian. Uh, he has a kayaking program in San Marcos, Texas for wounded warriors. Really wonderful service to the community. Uh, the portrait was initially just supposed to be him, but his, his wife and their new, new daughter had come home and it was impossible to resist pulling them into it. Whether she liked it or not, it happened. So that's what you see there. Uh, this guy, lovely human being, uh, works with with wood. He makes furniture solely made out of wood. He inherited a family business that had been up and running for, God, like 50, 60 some odd years. Um, made some really wonderful stuff in that shop. I did some travel stuff for them as well. Uh, cool, Hivewild. So Hivewild is a company I work for. I'm the in-house photographer for. They are a contemporary dance collective based out of Brooklyn. They do really, really wonderful work. Uh, Catherine Maxwell is the choreographer. I had the good fortune of going to one of their shows a few years ago uh, and being really inspired by some of the stuff that they were doing. Does anybody have a, a dance background in this room? Anybody ever work in dance at all? Okay, that's a start. How'd it go? Uh, it wasn't, I had two left feet, apparently. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, apparently I do, too, because uh, I have a performance background. Uh, I went to school for acting. We'll talk about that more in a second. But I, I remember a friend brought me to the show, and I was so inspired by, by the piece, because it's, it's very contemporary. They do, a lot of, they do a lot of classical ballet. The dancers, the people that work with them are very, very well trained. But the style that they work in is... I believe it's called Gaga, um, which comes from this like Israeli dance, Bolshevik something or other uh, troupe. Uh, so there's a lot of sort of stolen moments on stage where the dancers will sort of physicalize through different, different sort of processes. It's very visceral. It's very beautiful. I was very touched by the performance. And afterwards, I approached Catherine Maxwell, the choreographer, and I said, I love your work. How can I contribute to this? How can I be a part of this? She said, do you dance? And I said, probably not so well. She said, well, what do you do? I said, well, I take photos. And she said, Hive Wild is expanding. We're looking for a documentary photographer to sort of join us along the way. Uh, so from that moment forth, like two years ago, I said yes. And I've had the good fortune of spending a lot of time with, with dancers. So what that means is I do, uh, I do production stills for them. I go and I photograph the shows. I normally pop into a tech rehearsal for about 30 minutes uh, and just sort of take my shoes off, get on stage, and capture what I can capture using the available light in the space. I also get booked with them to come into the studio when they're, when they're working on stuff, and I shoot process stuff for them, which has been really fun, uh, behind-the-scenes stuff. 
as you can see here. Uh, and I also do promotional materials. Shameless self-plug. Here we go. Uh, this is actually a show that they've been working on the past couple of months that opens uh, next week. If you're around Greenpoint or just want to see some really amazing uh, contemporary dance, October 13th through 15th at Triskillian Arts Center. Their work will mesmerize you. It'll change lives. Uh, I love everything about what they do. So I also do some beauty stuff here and there and submit to magazines. You know, I work with, with agencies. They'll, they'll send out models to do so, like, some testing. I'll work with a stylist here and there and sort of self-submit to like fine art magazines and quarterlies. Welcome. Come on in. Uh, so that's been really fun. Working with, uh, working with models is really nice. Does anyone here do beauty or fashion at all? No? It's, uh, it's really miraculous how working with models will improve the quality of a frame when, when someone walks in front of a camera who's been solely working for a camera. They just they always know what to do. It's, it's really fun. I try to keep it open. I try to do a little bit of, little bit of everything. But yeah, this is some of the beauty stuff that I've done. Yeah. And most of what you're seeing, by the way, if anyone is interested, is uh, natural and available light. That's my preference. Uh, so that's sort of my, some of my commercial work, my portfolio. I am a documentary photographer. But you know, got to keep the lights on. Everyone freelances and does stuff like that. So my path, um, I was born in Austin, Texas. Has anyone in the room ever been to Austin? A couple of people. Nice. You were there on Friday? Oh, you're going there. Cool. Uh, it's a very, very lovely place, sort of the, uh, you know, arts mecca of the state. Uh, it's what most people refer to as a blue dot and a big red C. And ironically, the picture that I found for this presentation <laughs> is a red dot and a big blue C. So overlook that. Uh, so I was, I was raised in a very open household. I tell people I was raised by hippies because I was raised by a single woman and her friends essentially and my uncles and uh, very like rock and roll sort of household. I was told at a very young age that I could uh, express myself and make things and create things and was not only told that I could do that, but I should do that. It wasn't about so much chasing a fortune. It was about immediately securing my, my happiness. And so I decided I wanted to be a storyteller. So my first venture into storytelling was actually, this is really embarrassing. Uh, thank you, Mandy. Uh, this was me uh, sort of starting out on the road as a musician. I learned how to play the drums, and I, I toured around in bands playing, playing music for a couple of years, uh, recording albums and, and stuff, getting to collaborate with a bunch of different artists. Maybe you've heard some of the music that I wrote. Don't know if I have permission to show that, but I did. Uh, cool, and then that evolved for me, and I got into acting. I went to Texas State University and got a BFA in acting. Uh, and decided I wanted to tell stories in a new way uh, as a performer. Uh, so I did that for a while. I, I worked in film. Uh, I worked in theater. I traveled around doing regional theater. Has anyone seen a little show called The Midsummer Night's Dream? No? Rings a bell? Yeah, cool. Did, did stuff like that for a while. I uh, had a good time, but eventually that evolved for me again. Uh, to, to, where I, to where I am now, to the point from which I stand and talk to you guys in this room. I was living in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I was living in this acting house, and I was living in the attic of an acting house, which probably shouldn't have been a room offered to the actors, but the way it worked was there was like an opening day of the, the season for the company that I worked for, and they had a certain number of rooms for the actors who showed up, and it was first come, first serve. And I was a day late, so I got the last room available, which was an attic. So I spent a year living in an attic, which was kind of difficult. Um, and as, as the contract is wrapping up, I came across this photo that I had taken many, many, many years ago. And I, I was staring at this photo, and I was really, really struck by the narrative in this photo. Uh, I took this in the early 2000s in 
Port Aransas, Texas, uh, on a beach camping trip. My mom gave me a Polaroid camera when I was a, a teenager. And so all the while I was traveling for, for music or, or for acting, I was taking photos, sort of as a hobby. Uh, but suddenly, I'm looking at this photo that I found that I carried with me. And the story just sort of came to life for me. I could, I could like, taste. I could taste the, the salt water, the ocean waves. I could hear the children giggling. I remember what it felt like looking at this image of birds swooping in and going to town on a bag of Doritos on this, on this table, you know? And it all just came to life for me. And I realized that that was something that I wanted to do, was tell, tell stories in the narrative form, the photo form. So then I moved to New York uh, to do that, and here I am. Um, since I've been here, I've worked at Milk Studios in the digital department, uh, sort of working in the cage. I wanted to get my hands on as much gear as possible, figure out how all that stuff worked. I, I shadowed photographers for a while, fashion did a little of that, apprenticed with a guy for a year. And then eventually I ended up running a photographer's studio for almost a year, sort of running commercial production and helping out with that. All the while falling in love with the work of these guys. Uh, does anyone in the room not know who, who the Magnum Collective is? Are we all familiar? OK, cool, awesome, welcome. So the Magnum Collective of Photographers, this is, this is living. This is past. This is present. Uh, sort of the creme de la creme shooters. Uh, it was founded, I believe, by Robert Kappa. Alan, are you listening back there? Is this right, Robert? Oh, OK. I heard. I, yeah, Robert Kappa with, alongside Henri uh, Brisson, Henri Henri Cartier Brisson, sort of a, a collective, an agency, if you will. They represent themselves, and these are really some of the best shooters in the world. And a lot of what you're going to see here is that sort of old reportage style, the the photojournalists, um, the the documentary photographers. So to get more specific, on my path to get where I am today. I started studying the work of these guys and falling head over heels in love with how they tell stories. So, specifically on that list, this guy is one of my favorites, Christopher Anderson. I highly recommend checking him out. Very, very versatile photographer. Uh, not only can he take a fluorescently lit, shutter drag, hauntingly beautiful portrait of uh, Hillary Rodham, but he can take this moody noir photo. He's not someone you seem to like hire for his, his skill. He's someone you'd hire for his style, his signature. And the beautiful thing about that is that his signature is never really the same. He's, to me, he's a true artist. He, he tells a different story every time. So that's sort of the format that I liked following. Uh, people like Alec, Alec Sot here, with his you know, urban documentation of life. Full body, full body portraits of someone like Patrick Frazier. I mean, this thing is practically an oil painting. I, I think it's so beautiful. I'd highly recommend looking at his work. So then I started realizing that I was more interested in, in that sort of style of documentary photography, the, the turn of the century full body portraiture, circa the, the tin type and the larger format, like Ansel Adam type cameras. Uh, Something about the time it takes to set up a photo with a subject like this, rather than just sort of running in and grabbing an image. Like, these, these subjects are present in all of these photos, and that's not really something I think happens anymore. Um, it's somewhere in that sort of you know, tedious manual setup of working with like a, a, a tripod and a, and a dark slide. The, uh, that veneer that they brought to the camera, the facade, starts to melt away. And what you're left with is a person's true essence. I think that's absolutely beautiful. So that's sort of how I came to know my, my style, what I wanted to do with the camera. So as we move forward and look through some of the, the stuff that I've shot, I'm going to talk about my process how I take the photos that I've taken, my purpose, why I'm a photographer, I think why you're all in this room here today, everyone loves the medium, why I specifically take these kinds of photos, and then the pursuit, 
what I do with these photos or what I do not do with these photos. So when I was asked to come in and talk about my process, it felt silly initially because I am still so, so new to this. Uh, and I'm still figuring out what I want to say with the camera and the images I want to take. As you saw earlier, I've clearly taken images uh, from an array of genres of photography, finding my way. But there's this really wonderful quote from Robert Frost. Anybody into Robert Frost in the house? There are only middles. It's this idea that whether I'm two and a half years into this or 10 years into this or 50 years into this, like maybe a lot of people in this room, no matter what background you come from, you're always going to be in the middle of something. You're always going to be working through something. You have standards for yourself, and you're going to reach those goals, and then you're going to have new standards. So what I'm talking about today is sort of where I'm at right now with, with my photos and my truth today. The purpose. Photography to me is a, a life practice. The act of taking the photos themselves are what give me purpose. And uh, pursuit. What do you want to do with the photos that you take? I think that's an important question that every individual has to ask themselves at some point. Who's it for, really? Um, is anyone familiar with the work of Vivian Meyer? Yeah. So Vivian Meyer. Um, was a nanny living in Chicago, I believe it was, in like the 30s and 40s and 50s. And um, there's a really wonderful documentary that was made in, I think, 2007 called Finding Vivian Meyer. Has anyone seen the documentary? Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. So to the people in the room that don't know who this woman is, she was discovered, her work, her body of images was discovered posthumously. Am I saying that word right? Posthumously, posthumously? Yeah. Uh, so for all we knew, she was living her life, uh, walking around Chicago with these kids day after day, just doing what you do. Rather like private person, as we, we learned in the documentary. Eventually, you know, many, many years later, there's, a, there's like an estate sale, and somebody covers, uncovers a bunch of her, her stuff. And we find boxes that contain hundreds and thousands of negatives. So a guy takes a chance, and he buys the box, and he hires a team of like, techs to scan it all in. And what he's left with when he scans everything is, is like one of the greatest street photographers of all time. Uh, and she didn't care to publish a single photo. She did the work for her. I, I find that example to be, to be really, really, really beautiful. So why I'm doing all of this? To me, it's a life practice. It's a meditation, having a camera with you everywhere you go. The things you'll see, it's a meditation. So on sort of the, uh, the, the theme here with, with Vivian Meyer and making work that you're satisfied with, this is a question I think most people should ask themselves when they're starting out. There's a lot of noise uh, when you're starting a new, a, new, a new line of work. There's a lot of examples of how it's done and how to succeed in this thing that you're doing. Uh, especially today in this digital age with photography, you have, you have Instagram and you have all of these applications. And so it's really easy to be influenced, which is a good thing. But I think it's also important to distinguish the difference between inspiration and influence. Uh, at some point, you have to figure out what you want to say. If you don't have an audience, like what do you want to take pictures of? Do you want to photograph dancers? Do you want to do photojournalist stuff? Do you want to do war photography? Do you want to be a portrait photographer? And the second part of that, if no one is looking, do you make anything at all? Just sort of the school of thought I, I come from with, with my work. Very philosophical approach, perhaps, but yeah. And then this is one of my favorite quotes about writing. We write to taste life twice, in the moment and in retrospect. She was a, a French poet. She wrote Anais Nin. She wrote Henry and June and uh, the Delta of Venus. Um, this is sort of why I, this is sort of why I take photos. This journey for me is to document my time on this planet. So to review of that, photography is uh, a practice. It's a meditation. Uh, never without a camera, sort of my, my motto. 
Uh, why am I never without a camera? Because of this guy. This is, this is the kind of thing that you, you find on the street that you'll kick yourself for if you do not have a camera when this kind of subject walks in front of you. So I think you can see an arm in this frame. Yeah, so this is a coffee shop on Bloom and Orchard in the Lower East Side. And I was having coffee with a friend. And Marlon Brando here walks up uh, <laughs> into the picture with his, with his greyhounds. I'm not really a dog person. I think those are greyhounds. Anyone care to pitch in? No? What's that? Labrador's baby. Maybe. Cool. Even within that, I don't know if they're, they're purebred or what. They were just the most magnificent like dogs. And I think to this guy, who was a boxer, by the way. He was coming from the gym. Uh, they're like his, his trophy dogs. But uh, I found him on the street, and I couldn't resist. And I approached him, and he was, he was all about it. He was in kind of a hurry. Uh, the, thing, the thing I love about this photo is that I asked him if he was OK with it. And he said, what do you want me to do? I said, I don't want you to do anything. I'm just going to take a couple of steps back and set up a shot and just look into the camera. I never tell my subjects what to do because I don't want to, yeah, I don't really want to alter what naturally, organically was going to come from them in that given moment. So I, I don't really like to stage shots in that way. So this is completely and totally of his own device, the sort of pose that he fell into. The, uh, the irony here is that I asked him to pose to get ready. I didn't ask the dogs. He didn't ask the dogs, but the dogs posed too. <laughs> Uh, so I really, I really love the shot. I think I took two or three frames. I got his information, and uh, I sent him the portrait, and hopefully he likes it. Um, typically, when I photograph people on the street, I get their contact info so that I can share the images, because I think it's a good idea. Another reason I'm never without a camera, this guy. Um, anybody spend time in the far Rockaways out on the beach there? Yeah? Lovely, lovely place. I fell in love with it. I'm, I'm from Texas. I spent a lot of time on the, uh, the Gulf Coast of Mexico growing up. So I miss beaches. Um, so this summer, actually, I was working on a new series out there, uh, People of the Rockaways. I'm still sort of figuring out what that series is. But all in all, I'd say I went out there about 25 times in about two months looking for people like this, sort of. Uh, and this happened to be a sort of a, a sequence of photos that I caught as this guy on the boardwalk outside of Ripper's Cafe was just having a good time with his, with his ball. And I think it really works well as a sort of triptych or triptych. Or these girls. These girls uh, braving the tide, uh, this untitled piece. This is a 35 millimeter film. This is an expired roll of Fuji Superior 800. If, any, if anyone out there is taking note of that sort of thing. Or these brothers, another reason that I am never without a camera. Anybody ever see the movie City of God? Yeah. yeah. It was totally accidental, but I think this kind of resembles the cover of City of God, or like the the book litter or something or other. Um, it was such a lovely moment that I happened upon that I was really, really grateful for. Uh, and then I sat maybe 50 or 60 yards away from these kids as they were coming out of the water. And uh, what followed was, was just out of this world. Um, they seem to be the nicest. And I'm, I'm not trying to make a judgment on these people. They seem to be like really, really nice kids. But as they were leaving the beach, they got into a fight with a lifeguard. And they were like kicking sand and throwing things at them and just saying the most profane things. Uh, and everyone, everyone there was sort of taking note of what was going on. And eventually several groups, because they were like heckling this lifeguard for doing his job. So several groups sort of like lobbied together and tried to get these like, kids off the beach. But this happened right before that. Uh, and what I love about this image is no matter where these kids came from, they're, in this moment, they're absolutely untethered and they're, and they're free. So, love that image. 
guy on the street outside of a gallery in Austin, Texas. Another reason I'm never without a camera. Um, and to define that more articulately, photography is a practice I feel connects you with your environment, connects you with the people around you, and it keeps you in the present moment. Uh, technically speaking, when I shoot, I use uh, multiple systems. Um, I'm kind of a Canon guy, if I may, but just like a painter has to know which brushes leave which kind of strokes, I think it's important to try many different systems. Uh, I mean, I shoot, I shoot anything, really. Canon, Nikon, Leica, Fuji, Mamiya, Sony, I think they're all wonderful. Uh, essentially, I believe the camera was perfected somewhere in the 1950s. Most of what we have added to it are just bells and whistles, but if you know how to use those three things, your aperture, your shutter speed, your ISO, then, then you're golden. It's just figuring out which tool works for you. And for the most part, I use, uh, I use natural and available light. If I could get gear specific, this lens is my like, go-to lens, the 85. 1.2, the L series, the Canon L series, my favorite glass. Uh, anyway, moving forward. Okay, cool. So, Half Blood. This is uh, the first documentary series in my portfolio I want to talk to you guys about. Uh, so, Half Blood is the story of. Uh, a sort of reunion with, uh, with these long lost brothers um, explores the commonality between, between brothers. These two individuals are not related to each other. These two people have never met each other. These two people do not know the other exists. These are actually my half brothers. Uh, these are my half brothers, Dylan and, and Dustin. Uh, Dylan and I met right before I took this set of photos down in, in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, we share the same dad. Dustin and I uh, share the, the same, same mom. We grew up together, but then had a sort of a falling out as teenagers, and I hadn't really seen him in about a decade before I, I took these photos. So how this began, I was coming down to, to Texas last year to shoot for a magazine, and uh, my brother got on Facebook and had reached out to me about possibly meeting up and being reintroduced as adults, you know, sort of coming back together as, as humans and figuring out what we were about and just sort of catching up for, uh, for lost time. Uh, and so I was all set to, uh, to shoot with him. I asked if I could take his photo and he was, he was cool with it. Uh, and then Dylan here, who I knew had existed but had never met, happens to majestically write me that week. Um, and he says, like, hey, I'm living in San Antonio. I just got back from Afghanistan. Uh, if you're interested in having a relationship with me, I, I'm in Texas. Hit me up. And I said, how, how appropriate. I'm going to be in Texas next week, actually. I would love to meet you. I would love to be in your life. Can I take your photo? Uh, and he was OK with it. So I took these in different places at different times. But some really, really striking thing that I love about this, this series of photos I didn't really have a shot list in mind, and I took about 15 photos of each of my brothers. But when I, when I sort of uploaded everything and scanned everything in and looked at everything and looked at what they were telling me, I was just seeing this like striking similarity between these two individuals, two very troubled individuals who, are, who have seen some stuff. I mean, he's, he's a war veteran. He's in the Wounded Warrior program. Uh, and, and then my, my brother, Dustin. You know, sort of figuring out what they're going to do next at this uh, stage in life. So putting these, these photos together into uh, a series, I, I learned quite a bit about the two of these individuals. Every single one of these tattoos tells a, tells a really wonderful story uh, of a, a brother that he, he had known and loved and, and lost. Uh, and I got to hear all of those stories, and now I can tell their stories. So when I met Dylan, we were both kind of nervous about meeting each other. Uh, he brought a girlfriend with him, and I brought a good friend of mine, sort of just comfort zone stuff. We went out for an afternoon, had a great time together. And then I noticed the, the sun was going down, and it was time to, to set up the, the shots. And I'd already sort of pre-scouted this like really minimalist location nearby. 
So I ask him if he's ready, and it's our first time alone together. So we, we go to my rental car, grab my uh, tripod I shot on a Mamiya RZ67, if anybody shoots medium format film. Uh, nice. Um, and I'm setting up the shot in this alley, and he stops me. He's looked at my work, and he understands what I'm after, uh, what I want to do with the photos. And he says, before you take this, I want to make sure that you get it. I want to make sure that you get me in these photos. I just kind of want to talk to you for, for a minute about like, you and what I've been missing from, from you. So I moved uh, my body to the front of the camera, and I was kind of freaking out about losing my light. But we had a good 30-minute powwow where he caught me up on his life and the things that he'd seen and the places he traveled. And uh, neither one of us knew our dad growing up. That's sort of our common bond. Uh, and one really important thing I'll never forget that he told me was he had so many brothers that he'd loved and lost in the war. And they were all so close to him. And he was really nervous about meeting his real life brother uh, because even though I was flesh and blood, he was worried I wasn't going to be as good as them. Uh, which was really powerful, and that left a mark with me. And so I assured him that I was. We hugged it out. We agreed that we were going to have a relationship together. We were going to be in each other's lives. I asked him if he was ready. I moved my body to, to position. And I, I started shooting. And I took about 10 to 15 photos of him that, that afternoon. And they're some of my favorite photos I've ever, I've ever taken. Uh, I don't know what the photos would have looked like had I just started shooting. I was really nervous because of who this subject is and who he is to me, so I was very nervous. But typically, I spend a good 20 to 30 minutes just talking, you know, talking with my, with my subject, getting to know them first before we even involve the camera. The camera is secondary. It just happens to be there, and it captures what's organically already happening. Um, so I don't know what those photos would have looked like, but I know how these came out. And he is 100% present with me in these photos. I, and there's a certain, um, there's just a certain connection that I, I really love about this. This is an interesting story. I'm not sure how willing he was to do this. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has people who, who have served recently. Uh, but I've noticed a lot of the people that I know who have served come back with this sort of like anti-war mentality, anti-government. Anti and uh, it's a complicated issue, certainly. And I felt like I had very little room to ask him to do such a thing. And he knew what I was going to ask him before I even asked him, I said, so there's a thing that you guys do or you did when you, and he looked at his feet, he took a really deep breath, and he got into position, and he, he, he formed the salute. So yeah, beautiful day. Uh, and then my, um, this is my brother Dustin. I, again, when I put these photos together, they're striking. They're just, they're, they're so strikingly similar to me. Sort of a family album, a weird family album, if you will. But this is my family, and these are my portraits, and this is my story. This is their story, my story through their story. Anyway, uh, cool. On to the next series, a lot different, Flight of the Meningia. Any farmers in the room? Anybody grow up on a farm? You did. Um, so I got... I had the unique pleasure of spending a, a, a good portion of last year living on a farm in rural Michigan. Uh, Homer, Michigan, to be exact, it's um, 10 miles from like the nearest anything really, uh, big Amish community. Um, perfect place to, to start like a, a hobby farm. These images come from a hobby farm. Uh, this particular farm trades in uh, alpaca and, and sheep and goats. and uh, when I got there to work on this farm, I noticed that there was a sort of a slimming sheep population. And when asked about it, what was really happening, uh, there's a thing in the soil, forgive me because I'm not a farmer, I'm a city boy. Uh, there's a thing in the soil called a ninja worm. And the animals don't really know when to stop eating the, the grass. They just sort of, they eat down to the root and 
there's this like sort of parasitic thing in the soil that, that these animals eat, and it was killing them. Uh, so when I got there, the, uh, the, the flock of sheep, I think, was somewhere in the 30s, and by the time I left, it was like, there were like 10 or 11. So it was quite, uh, quite an alarming rate at which these, um, these sheep were dying. So I have this story that has this sort of un uncomfortable, un unsettling, unnerving uh, feel to it. These animals are running from, from me, because I'm a new presence on the farm, but they're also you know, kind of afraid for, for their lives. Uh, this is one of my favorite. I got really lucky with this one. These were some of the, the healthy ones that were being taken away and sold. And um, they'd just been ripped apart from their family. And right as I heard the, the truck starting to sort of pull them away, this tractor, I'm not sure what you call this, um, but I ran up. And this gate here that you see, this sort of like iron, clad iron gate that wraps around, it goes all the way around, even, even through the back doors. So I, I jumped up onto the back of it and caught this photo. And it was just one of those moments where everything was, was, was right without without asking, without anticipating, everything just sort of happened. And there's even, and this is really funny, because uh, it's kind of a sad photo. I think it's a kind of a, a beautifully sad photo. But there's even this uh, tucked away back here, black sheep. Does anyone, can anyone see these, these legs back here to the black sheep? Yeah, he's the only one not showing his face. I'm like, how perfect is that? I think it's funny. I, I think it's beautiful. And clearly, too, I love black and white photography, black and white film. Uh, yeah, I think it was out there for about six weeks. So whose farm is this? This farm actually belonged to uh, my, my dad, my dad Eddie, my biological father who I met on the internet. Uh, I met him in Cincinnati a couple of years ago when I was working out there. We, uh, we decided that we were going to be each other, in each other's lives and have a relationship. And we'd hung out a, a few times on the road. He's an ex-biker, really cool dude. I love the guy. Uh, but he invited me out to his farm, and sort of as a getting to know each other, I decided that I was going to work on his farm and, and hang out with the guy. So the interesting thing that was definitely not anticipated when I set out to document what was happening on his farm with the animals, there's this like really eerie feeling in the air, this really uncomfortable relationship between myself and, and the animals and what's happening. But there's also this parallel in this series uh, to sort of the, the, the awkward courtship of like me and this dude getting to know each other, which I think is really, really lovely. So this series inadvertently tells two stories. So yeah, that's my dad photographed in his kitchen last year under like a 40 watt bulb or something. I'm not even sure what that was. Old style ranch house. This is a, a portrait of him I took on a hunting day uh, in a field I really liked. We did just a, a couple of shots out in this opening. And he has not met my, my half-brother, Dylan, who you saw earlier in that series. Uh, but they both served. My dad served in Vietnam. Uh, but he, he'd seen the photos, and he knew that I had a relationship with him and that everything was copacetic. So right before we, we stopped at sundown, he asked if we could do one more and if I would be OK sending it to Dylan. Uh, and without really knowing what was happening, I said, sure, I assumed the position. Uh, most of these full body portraits, assuming the position means I'm kind of you know, coming down on my knees to make sure everything's from the right perspective that I like. I'm also a short guy, so that helps with my subjects when I shrink down to the ground. But uh, out of nowhere, he does this really cool like rifle trick and falls into this salute. And it's for my brother. So that's a, that's a very important photograph. And yes, in the end, I, I did end up sending it, sending it to Dylan. And he seemed pretty, pretty happy with the result. So that's a very special photo. Homer, Michigan is a beautiful place. I, I really loved my time out there. 
Uh, this is a series that I shot in Southeast Asia last year. Uh, these are faces of some of the people that I met along my journey. Uh, at the start of last year, before like my photography stuff really started taking off, I'd never left the, the US. Uh, so the time came when I had the good fortune of doing some travel. And most people start out in like, you know, Western Europe and stuff. And I'd, I'd heard so many stories about those places that I wanted to go somewhere that I knew nothing about. So I spent some time backpacking through Southeast Asia. Uh, I was in Bangkok for a while. I was in Chiang Mai. Throughout Thailand, I was in Cambodia. I, I went to China for a while. I did some island hopping around. And I had a camera with me everywhere I went. This series is more, uh, more street photography than anything. Uh, these are just portraits of people that I met along the way. This is a really great story. So this is in Veal, Cambodia, outside of Angkor Wat, uh, which is, I believe, like the oldest religious temple complex in the world. It was built in like the 12th century. Um, so I did the tourist thing for a day, and I walked through there. It's a really marvelous place. Has anyone ever been to Angkor Wat Temple, Siam Reap, Cambodia? Yeah. I, when did you go? Do you mind if I ask? About three years ago. Three years ago, yeah. yeah. It's amazing. This, these, this, this site has these, these walkways and these intricate carvings and everything underneath you, the columns, the ceilings, these friezes, they're everywhere. And it's not really regulated. I don't know how they would regulate it. They let you walk everywhere. And you can feel these stones from centuries ago crumbling under your feet. It's a magical place. It's one of my favorite places that I've ever been. Uh, but half, half a day through, I got tired and I needed to go rogue. You know, I needed to go off and, and do my own thing. So uh, in this torrential downpour from like a football field's length away, I come across this rice paddy. And uh, I was holding sort of two camera bodies and a, a, an umbrella between my, between my neck and my shoulder, which lay, later would cause a pretty awful spasm. It was a really dumb idea. I need to get one of those umbrella hats that you just wear on your head. Uh, don't have one, but I'm going to find one. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, I, ro I took my shoes off, and I left them on like this gravel path, and I rolled up my legs, and I, I started walking out here. And um, I'm about as far away from the whole group as this worker here is. And I, I make sure it's cool you know, before I, before I proceed. I knew very, very little. Uh, of the language, but I knew enough to not offend anyone and to make sure that what I was doing was was within the right. The first thing that I learned how to say every single place I went to in Southeast Asia was, may I take your photo, please, and thank you. Uh, so I asked if I could approach, and they all thought it was the craziest thing that I was there and covered in mud and wanting to just sort of watch, and I made sure that they knew I was taking photos of them and that they were okay with it. And uh, I spent about an hour out there just sort of standing around waiting for things to happen. And they were so afraid of me in the first part of it. But by the, by the end of it, somewhere around the time that I get to about this uh, proximity to these people, they start to open up to the camera. And uh, right around the time the whole group is on to the next patty about that far away, they were shouting goodbye and smiling at me. So I made a whole new group of friends in Veal, Cambodia that day. So, yeah, I, lo I love these images so much. Um, this is a monk um, praying in Angkor Wat. You can kind of see the temple in ruins in the, the background there. This is, uh, I think, outside Bangkok, Thailand, outside of a, a market, just a bus whizzing by. I got super lucky. There's a town uh, in the middle of Bangkok, uh, like a sort of mini town within, within Bangkok. It's referred to as the town on the tracks. Uh, a lot of people have actually gone there and, and, and taken photos. And I sort of happened upon it by accident. Um, it's a really, really impoverished part of downtown Bangkok. And essentially, there's this, uh, this railroad track that goes straight through this little village that was built on the track, like just stacks and rows and stacks and rows of little cardboard houses that are like six feet away from this track. Like this tile that you see on the floor here, this is someone's doorstep. 
And then every time the train comes through, they pick up all their stuff, they move it back inside, and then they let the train pass, and then they go back to just existing. And I came across this kid and his father, and um, I'd asked permission, of course. Uh, the father from a distance tells his kid that it's OK. He can play with a weird guy with a camera. Uh, and the kid, you know, kind of nailed it. He's a natural. If I could have, I would have encouraged him to try to get into modeling, because he's just the perfect subject. I got so lucky. And then luckily for me, this was digital, so I had the unique opportunity of, of being able to share with him immediately. This is when that LCD screen, I know Leica took it away from the new camera, but like this is when that LCD screen really comes in handy. I got to show him the image. And I was holding my only camera, but I really wish I had another camera to take a photo of his face when he saw his face on the back of my camera. The kid just freaked out. It was, it was unreal. It was so, it was so beautiful. And then he started grabbing for the camera, and so I brought it closer to his face. And then he tried to like put it in his mouth. It was really strange. He, like tried to eat my camera, essentially. So I had to leave. But anyway, that's in Bangkok. This uh, photo, another one I got really, really lucky with uh, outside of uh, Siam Reap, Cambodia, and a small village. I don't know what exactly they were doing in the village, but I came across this man on a horse. He was bathing his horse in the water. And uh, I took my time sort of working my way up to, to him. He was away from everyone else. And uh, I'd asked him if he would pose for a picture. And in the only broken English that he really had available in that moment, he says something to the effect of $2. <laughs> I didn't have any money. I, I had like huge US bills and like not enough in, oh god, Khmer? I'm, I forget what the, what the exchange is. I'm so sorry. Um, but out, out of respect for him and his wishes, I really I didn't have the money at the time, and I was kicking myself. So I started walking away. And then he, he sort of yells at me from, from like 10 feet away and motions for me to come back. And then as I'm standing there, he stands next to his horse, indicating, it's OK. This horse is too beautiful not to photograph. Do it anyway. And I, I got. I got really, really, really lucky. I took two or three frames you know, down on my knee with him and the horse. Uh, the horse wasn't so much into it, as you can see him holding the, the, the reins, the front of the horse. That one needed to be pulled in. Wasn't feeling the camera so much. Um, yeah, and then they, they went back into the water for, for a little bath. So that was fun. I was very grateful to him and to the universe for that, that experience. So Leviathan, this is a documentary series I, I did that explores uh, the fear of intimacy. Something totally different, um, inspired by a lot of different things in my life, really. Uh, it's sort of an obsessive glimpse, I've, I've called it, into the era of dating. Um, into dating in the era of the more connected, but the more alone. So. At the, end of, uh, at the end of last year, I tried, I tried dating on the apps. I don't know if anyone's ever used the apps for dating. Uh, they're kind of awkward. They're actually, they're, they're really, really awkward. I'm not going to, yeah. Hey, there we go. I'm not going to name any in particular right now, because uh, legally, I don't think I'm allowed to. <laughs> but uh, I, I went on about seven of those over the course of a couple of months. And what I found was just so interesting. Um, initially, I wanted to do a, a portrait series of, of the people I dated, uh, of the women I went out with, but it just seemed intrusive and male gazy and inappropriate. So I quickly realized that was a dumb idea, and I kept thinking of things that I could do, and it never really occurred to me. I was just really curious about this period of my life. So what these apps do is they give you this like split, split moment, split decision, um, very, very quick, ill-informed impression of a person that you're going to go out with. And then you go out on these dates, and whether, whether it was you or the other person that didn't really hit the mark that you were expecting to land on, to no fault of either of you, it never really seems to work out. And this is the part in the speech where somebody tells me, 
I met my husband on, on the app, and I put my fist in my mouth. But until you speak up, because I don't think you're here, they're weird. They're so weird. And so I had a lot of uh, uh, weird um, experiences. And then, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just started focusing on my work. And then I'll be totally honest, I didn't really date anyone for a, for a solid year. And it was a really interesting year. And this series, like no other series I've done, was formed backwards. I was sort of going through the archives, and I was looking at the images that I'd been taking, just everyday images. Um, and I noticed in this very voyeuristic series that's mostly street photography, if you will, I noticed that there's a, the images were telling me something. There's this, sort of, there's this sort of like distance between myself and my subjects in this period. There's this innate curiosity I have of, of couples, the ones who succeeded, the ones who made it work. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, uh, after, after a while, I just thought, I'm not that weird guy like in the corner photographing couples, but something about going through the archive and looking and noticing a trend in the kind of photos I was taking, I had to do something with that. So I put everything into, into Bridge. I, in my workflow, I typically use Adobe, the, the Adobe Creative Suite. Uh, I was in Bridge, and I was just sort of highlighting photos that like really seemed to complement each other. And then I think one day on accident, uh, I might have hit a, hit a slider. I was playing with hue and saturation. And this sort of really, really beautiful not filter, it's not a filter, but this sort of treatment, this color treatment of these photos came to, came to being. And then I looked back through everything and I realized I'm in a dark room right now. And this is a very, very, very like weird, mysterious thing that I'm looking at. And I don't really know what it's telling me, but I feel like I'm looking at a contact sheet in a dark room when I'm like working on film stuff. Uh, and then when I go back and look at everything together, I think it tells a, a really, Really beautiful story. So, so this is a uh, this is sort of my flagship documentary series. This is my favorite so far. Uh, this is a portrait series of people that I've met while traveling the country uh, the past couple of years. This is the first idea that I had for a documentary series. The first thing I started working on, and more than likely, it will be my last series. This is also as political as I get with my photography. Uh, Over the Land, the title comes from Francis Scott Key's Star Spangled Banner. Um, it's a very tumultuous, tumultuous time politically that we're in. We have all kinds of like, you know, uh, cultural identifications and ideologies and things that have always sort of been there but are now okay to come out to the surface. And a lot of these, these groups of people and these groups of thought are being met with opposition. And we're forgetting our, our commonality, our common bond, uh, especially during this presidential election, you know, like no other that I've seen. It's, it's creating such a divide. And being on Facebook for a lot of this just makes you nauseous, seeing what the different camps and the, the people want to say about each other. It just, it's horrendous. Uh, so I photograph people uh, for this series from, from all walks of life. Uh, from people whose situations mirror yours, they mirror my own, people who have been kind of down on their luck at times. Uh, and what I hope to do by putting these people in the spotlight and helping them tell their stories, I have uh, uh, just a million of these that I'm working on getting up on my, my website uh, with text eventually. Uh, but by putting these people in the spotlight, I hope to not only uh, evoke tolerance in, in, in my viewers, but I hope to remind people just how shared the human experience is. We're all doing this together. Uh, so this is a couple, uh, Brian and Stacy, that I met in South Texas uh, while traveling around. They're outside their, uh, their his, his work truck here. Her son, Zach, is off playing with a deflated soccer ball 20 feet to the right. Um, and this was shot on that Mamiya RZ67. And what I love about this photo uh, is I took my time to, to frame it and I love it too because I, I sort of got this frame within a frame within a frame thing going on here. Um, but in the process, uh, in the time that it took to set this photo up, what, what began is them sitting on the tailgate and sort of like 
hey, for the photo, this sort of like facade that was presented when I was ready to just like click away, I said, hold on, I got to work through this. Whatever that thing was that they were going to share with me, that very false expression of themselves, melted away, as I mentioned earlier, with, with the, the full body portraiture stuff I love. And then this is what, this is what they gave me by the time I, I was ready. I took the one shot, and, and I think there's a, a really beautiful, a beautiful connection. I think on the surface, they'd like you to think that everything's fine in their world, and they're no different than you, because they think that you're happy and perfect and have it all figured out uh, in your life. But not all of us do. We're all working on stuff. Everything is a process. We're always in the middle of things. And uh, yeah, they decided to share that with me that day. So that was lovely. Uh, these are border collar, border collie. I'm so sorry. I think it's very obvious by this point. I'm not really a dog person. <laughs> these are border collie breeders. <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. Yeah, this is somewhere, uh, somewhere in Michigan outside of uh, Detroit on a farm, another farm, not my, my dad's farm, but another farm. Uh, we set up this perfect shot with these people who spend the majority of their lives with dogs, who on the surface are a little eclectic and kind of hard to find, uh, find uh, like a common bond with when you, when you first talk to them. Um, not that they've like disassociated disassociated themselves from people, but they spend a lot of time with, with dogs. Um, and yeah, I don't know, I just I spent a couple of hours out there watching them do their things. If I was a dog person, this would be the dog that I had. These dogs are awesome. They're, su they're such good dogs. So they use these dogs for sort of uh, herding livestock. Uh, and these dogs are very, very disciplined. They're trained very well. Um, they're rarely going to bite at the ankles of these, these calves or these sheeps or these goats. Uh, they're very, very respectful animals. Um, so this farm had about 22 or 23 of these. And I would like to show you the shot where I got all 23 dogs in. But I do not have a shot where I got all 23 dogs in. So I'm not going to show you that picture because it's not a good picture. But I tried really hard. I tried for all of you. Uh, it just didn't happen. And this guy is like Grandpa. This is, this is the dog, if it's not clear, like this is the dog. Uh, and she is the matriarch of the whole operation. She's famous in Michigan. Um, so yeah, it was a pleasure to meet them and spend the day with them. Uh, and eventually, you know, like I said, I, I get everyone's contact information, everyone that I meet, and I send them the, the stuff. Uh, they have a business, they have a website, and I believe these photos made it on the, the website. It's sort of like their business portraits. So that was pretty cool. It's a nice little Transaction, I got to learn a lot about border collies, even though I can barely say it. Uh, and they got these, uh, these business portraits, if you will. Um, this is outside of a county fair. Uh, I met this couple who I am apparently related to. Uh, they're really lovely people. They're very distant, distant cousins of mine, like three or four times removed. Really, really lovely people. Uh, told me all about how the, the world of the 4-H 4H, 4-H works. That's something that kids do at a really young age in these communities, um, raising livestock and trading them and whatnot. I love this frame in particular. Same process, you know, full body portrait. I found the position. You have these really lovely uh, shapes back here. You have a sidewalk plane. You have this uh, sun-kissed patch of grass, and then you have this uh, shaded patch of grass. So I, I really love the, the shapes behind them. I think it helps pop them from the background. Uh, if you haven't noticed a trend in my work, I like to choose really simple backgrounds. Um, you're not going to see any sort of like sports or wildlife or nature photography from me. I think all of that is beautiful. Again, this goes back to sort of finding your own truth and figuring out what you are meant to be shooting. Uh, for me, it's about people. It's about the sort of shared human experience. But also, if I, if I have to talk about background, that background is sick. OK. Uh, this is Kayla and Layla. I met them at a, a laundromat in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Uh, I asked if they were together. <laughs> and she said, yes and no, she's kind of married. <laughs> 
Uh, that was one of those really unfortunate instances where I sent them this portrait and the email bounced back. And I, I didn't know if I'd ever see them again, but I, I thought the portrait was just absolutely stunning. And I got so lucky. I didn't do anything. It was all them. Um, they knew what I was after. We met, we talked, we folded our clothes together, you know, heard a little bit about the drama in their world at that particular moment that they were able to leave behind at the community laundromat, you know, which is what I do too when I wash my clothes. Anyway, also, this is one of the, I think, only pictures in this entire presentation you're going to see that's not uh, natural or available light. This is a, a Minolta, like, on-camera speed light. It's, like, from 1982. It's broken. It rarely works. But when it does work, it just, like, gets everything I need into the frame. And laundry mats are dark, and this particular one had, like, one working light. So I threw on a flash, and I got this uh, prom picture of the two of them which I, I really love. A lot of nice color in this one. Uh, this is a dishwasher I happened upon in Chelsea. Ricky was his name. His email did work, so he did get this picture. So that's cool. Uh, this is a friend I made backstage at the APED photo gallery at the Park Avenue Armory. Uh, he was stocking food in the, uh, the fridge there, and we talked for a minute. Really nice guy. Does anybody remember Winter Storm Jonas? That like last big storm that we had last year? Yeah. Who else remembers it? This guy remembers it. <laughs> Found this guy uh, somewhere in Brooklyn. Uh, Single-handedly sort of like cleared this entire path of this tiny little street that wasn't important for like the city. Not that I'm knocking the city, but like it wasn't important for the city to come through and like clean this up. Uh, but he had to get out. He had to go to work. His family had to go to work. So he, he had shoveled this. Uh, in this very kingly manner, I came across him the next morning. Uh, I tried to go out during that storm, by the way, uh, which was not so good idea. I didn't get any usable photos. Like the, it just didn't, it didn't really work, you know? Like it was so intense. Uh, I think I also sort of had a technical issue with my camera. It froze up at one point, and it had never frozen up on me before. So be careful with your cameras in extreme cold and extreme heat. Anyway, um, this is one of my favorite. This is Bob Lincoln. Uh, he's one of my oldest pen pals living in South Texas. I drove down there with my rental car to visit him and hang out with him. Uh, guy keeps to himself. We drank red wine out of a Pyrex measure, measuring cup and listen to uh, Sturgill Simpson and Willie Nelson and Johnny Cash and all those boys. And he told me about his war stories and just everything. This guy, I don't know if you can see this like walking stick. Oh, it's like right here. And it's also in his hand. Um, he's walked like most of South America over the course of his, you know, like 68, 69 odd years, uh, just like Hiking, walking, um, yeah, it's his favorite, favorite thing to do. Those are some of his favorite stories. He's one of the, uh, the most respectful, courteous people I've ever met. And he, he's just one of those people that just speaks like quips and, and idioms and has all kinds of really wonderful, heartfelt things to say. He's a really nice guy. I uh, really hope he's doing well. Um, this is the final image I'm going to share in this, uh, this series. This is Ray Hatch. Ray is a writer who is living in uh, San Marcos, Texas, who uh, caught wind that a, a good friend of his um, was given sort of a, a time frame to, to live. He was diagnosed with cancer, and he was living in New York. And Ray, Ray spent a lot of time in New York, like in the 50s and 60s. He hitchhiked up here back in the day and sold his wares, as he called them. I don't know what that means, but he sold his wares like on the street, and he became like best friends with this guy who still lives in the Northeast. So, um, and that's one of the only people he knew up here. So Ray haunts every single day this coffee shop down in, in San Marcos where I used to live, and we met a, a good many years ago, and he just started asking people in the coffee shop if they knew anybody in New York that could house him. And they were like, do you remember Travis? He used to work here. He used to make your coffee. And Ray has the sharpest memory 
of anyone. Ray's 79 years old and he doesn't forget a single thing. And Ray remembered who I was and he got my number and he called me and he asked if he could crash on my couch. And I said, why? And he's like, well, I'm, I'm coming to New York. I gotta, see my, I gotta see my friend one more time before he goes. Um, so I spent three days with Ray. I photographed him uh, the final morning. I made him French press coffee and really some really terrible egg plate. I don't really know how to cook. Um, we said our goodbyes, and uh, I photographed him in, in the living room of my apartment his final day. But over the, over the course of the, the three days, I, I was just so, so lucky and so grateful that this guy like, came into my life. I mentioned Vivian Meyer earlier. You had a lot of people in the room who like Vivian Meyer. He is the living Vivian Meyer in my world. I mentioned that Ray's a writer. Ray's a very good writer. Ray's one of the best writers that I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. He brought a backpack, torn backpacks. This guy, his legs are just like crap, but his mind is so razor sharp. Um, too, way too many. He wanted to share them with his friend. He had these like manuscripts and these backpacks full of things that he'd been working on, um, all unpublished with zero intention of publishing these things that he was writing. He was writing for him. He was doing it for him the whole time. He's been writing about his travels all over the world and carrying these stories. And if you're lucky enough to meet Ray and he likes you, which he will because he likes everyone, and you ask, he will share with you. So I had three nights of like this poetry slam happening in my living room and getting to know this guy and reading his work. And it's like some of the best work. And I really hope that there's someone out there, maybe it's me, maybe I just inherited that, that responsibility, that shares his work soon. He had no intention of doing it. It was just a life practice for him. And so Ray is sort of a hero to me. I was very happy to meet him. Uh, Ray is one of the reasons that I do what I do. Photography is sort of a life practice. I'm going to continue taking portraits like, of people like Ray as long as I live and making connections like this. And, um, yeah, so, so hope, he's, hope he's doing well. He got to see his friend. I, I did hear from him afterwards. So I mentioned that in my workflow, I have a series of folders that I work through in Adobe Bridge, and typically it's something to the tune of the date, I sort it, I flag it, good, better, best, print, web, and then I send or I don't send or I print it. Uh, this particular series on my site exists with like 11 images. Today I brought to you maybe five images. In that like end folder of what am I going to choose, I think there were like 90 images. It was really hard to, to just figure out what it was and what it was supposed to be. And I shared uh, with a good friend of mine, uh, who's also a documentary photographer, what I was working on. And she said, be careful of the, the male gaze. Uh, you. I know that you don't intend for that to be sort of uh, an integral part of the story because that's really not what it's about. I, I really did have a hard time with apps and I've talked about a lot of people who's, who've dated on those apps and a lot of people say the same things. Uh, so this more is about millennials and this like school of thought with millennials than anything else. Uh, so in terms of uh, the evolution of that, I, I mean, I, I shoot with models. I, I take pictures of real people. I will probably take a picture of you before you all leave. I'm just going to do that real quick before I forget. Um, yeah, I, there, were a lot of gra there was a lot of graphic content, too, that I took out, because I didn't want it to be about that. And I wanted, when, I, when I'm designing a series, I want it to be as accessible as possible. So in terms of choosing what goes in to the final product, into the final storyline, my goal is to make it as universal, universally appealing and accessible as possible. Uh, so for this one, uh, for instance, headless woman here on a bed, there was another photo where she had a face. And something sort of changed in the storytelling when these subjects were, um, were, were faceless or were observed from a distance that I think really opened it up in, in a good way. Um, I know who these people are. I've met a lot of these people. Uh, some of them I know. A few of them I know. But in the end, my goal was to share my truth and express my feelings on, on this topic. But I also wanted to make sure that it was open enough for other people to relate to.
All right, cool. So unless there's no other questions, thanks for coming out, guys. It's been fun. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.